Hello and welcome to Game Sack. I've got more arcade games lined up, more than 10 of them in fact, that never came home and can only ever be played within the confines of a real legal arcade. Well actually, these could all be played at home in one way or another, but you know what I mean. The, the people who made these games decided never to bring them home for whatever reason. So what did consoles miss out on? Well, let's start off with an interesting one from Konami. Here's Monster Maulers from Konami. It was released in 1993. This one takes elements from a one-on-one -on -one fighting game as well as a beat-em-up and combines them into one. Overall, it works pretty well. You can select one of three goofy-looking characters. You can then select which stage to begin the game at. Most stages have you fighting one other enemy in a one-on-one -on -one style battle. The controls work similar to such fighting games. You have three attack buttons. Pressing up lets you jump and holding back lets you block. There are also special moves for you to discover for each character. However, your lives work like a beat-em-up. If you die, you just respawn right there or continue right there. You only need to drain your enemy's power once, so there's only one round, so to speak. After you beat all of the stages on the map, you're taken to a couple of stages where you fight the weaker enemies while on your way to the boss. I like how a few of the enemies are from Konami's shooters like this Easter Island head. They even have music derived from these games, like this one from Salamander. Most of the enemies here are crazy, and not exactly something that you would imagine battling in a normal fighting game. There are only a couple of enemies like this guy here who looks like he could be in a regular run-of-the-mill fighting game. I like the game's sense of humor, like when you beat this guy. He dies and the crows don't even wait three seconds before they peck at him. I don't know, maybe he rots really, really fast. The graphics are amazing, just like the large majority of Konami arcade games from the time. The colors are also extremely vivid, much more so than we saw in the likes of the Neo Geo. Scaling and especially rotation are all over the place. And like almost every single Konami game from the time, the music is fantastic with some fun tunes. It's definitely sad that this one never made it home. It's not based on a license, which many Konami arcades were, so that wasn't holding them back. If it had been ported to the 16-bit consoles of the time, we would have seen some severe cuts thanks to the high color count and the rotation on all of the segmented parts. But it still could have been good. Of course, this would have been right at home on the Saturn or the PlayStation, but at the time, people just wanted 3D stuff instead. Anyway, this is a great game, so be sure to go to your local arcade and play this right away. If they don't have it, be obnoxious and complain to the manager every single day. They really like it when you do that. Here's Dolphin Blue from Sammy, and it came out in 2003. This is a run-and-gun which may initially remind you a bit of Metal Slug. Only in this run-and-gun, you have a dolphin friend that you use in many of the stages. On your own, you can jump and shoot. A third button is a special attack, which you can do as long as the gauge at the bottom of the screen has a bit of juice in it. When it's full, the special attack will be at its strongest. When you're on the dolphin, you can still jump and shoot. Your special attack also works here, which makes the dolphin thrust itself into the enemy, causing quite a bit of damage. However, you can't turn around while you're on the dolphin, which can sometimes be inconvenient. If you really must, you can turn around and shoot behind you very quickly as you do a special attack and the dolphin is doing its thing. The dolphin is an interesting gimmick, but I must confess that I like the game more when it's not around. There are a few different weapons you can collect, all with limited ammunition. Even the rapid-fire ones only blast in short spurts, so you can't keep the button pressed down for too long. You'll need to constantly tap it no matter what. Although the game will remind you of Metal Slug, it doesn't have quite the same humor or appeal. Graphically, the game looks very sharp, with high-resolution sprites combined with plenty of polygons everywhere, though the gameplay is strictly 2D. The sound is loud and obnoxious, with music that blares away while you forget it the very next minute. It's not unfitting, though. Of course, we can only guess why this never came home, but I imagine that they just didn't think it would do well enough. 
This runs on the Atomis Wave arcade hardware, which is based on the Sega Dreamcast. As a result, the arcade ROM was hacked to be playable on a Dreamcast not too long ago. But don't be fooled, that's not an official port. In fact, sometimes the enemies can just disappear. Overall, this game is full of action and color. It's definitely worth trying if you can. This one's called Schmeiser Robo. It's from Hot B, and it was released in 1993. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game based on the incredible Schmeiser universe that we all know and love. Just kidding, it's an original IP. You choose from several different people that wear robotic armor. Control-wise, it's very simple. You have a punch, a kick, and a guard button. I'm never able to play fighting games that have guard or block buttons very well, and this one is no exception. For some reason, this one even seems less playable. The opponent will absolutely maul you, or at least me. As a result, I personally wasn't able to find a lot of enjoyment with this one. There's nothing here that makes me feel like I should keep trying in order to get better. It doesn't have enough pull. There's not much about this one that feels like an arcade game. It seems like it's running on a beefed up Genesis, but not beefed up enough to be a Neo Geo. The detail and colors are good, but you usually saw better in the arcades. The music is nice, but again, very Genesis-y. This would end up being the only fighting game that Hot B would ever produce. It probably never came home because compared to real fighting games, this one just didn't do so hot at the arcade and couldn't generate a following. No surprise. Maybe if this didn't come out over two years after Street Fighter II, it would have had more of a chance. This next one is a light gun game, so that means there's gonna be some screen flashing and that's kind of annoying, so sorry. However, I only talk about it for two minutes and 10 seconds, so I think you can tough it out. If for whatever reason you can't, well then just skip ahead two minutes and 10 seconds. This is Ranger Mission from Sammy, which came out in 2004. This is a light gun game which can be played by one or two players. Basically, you're inside of a simulation which is why all of the enemies are turning into fading wireframes when they die. I was playing with a light gun here and it wasn't working particularly well so please excuse how much you'll see me sucking as you watch this segment. Believe me, it wasn't for lack of trying. Anyway, each area here has a few different missions and each mission will have objectives to meet in order to qualify like killing a certain amount of enemies, or destroying at least 15 cars out driving around just going about their day. That's kind of mean, I think. I mean, they're just going down to run a movie or get some McDonald's or something. Jeez. You also have a time limit in most areas. Each mission, you'll have a different weapon, and you generally don't need to worry about running out of ammo, just reloading. I like how you have to shoot the hinges off of the doors to force your way to where more enemies are hiding. You will stop at nothing to kill these guys. The graphics are sharp and move at a great frame rate, but overall the details are pretty sparse and the colors are drab. The sound and music certainly work for the game, but it's nothing tremendously special either. I can't really say much more about this one due to my limited ability to play it properly, but I can tell you that it would have been much more fun had it been brought home and made playable via the GunCon 2 or something. I mean, who doesn't want more light gun games? I could watch a flashing white screen all day. I love that. I'm kidding, I don't like that, but I do like light gun games, and that doesn't really bother me as I play, only as I watch. At the same time, this one is certainly not on the level of such games as House of the Dead, Virtua Cop, or Time Crisis. Escape from the enemy's base. Go, hurry! Aim at a searchlight before they spot you. Roger that.
This is Pretty Soldier Sailor Moon from Band Presto, and it was released in 1995. This is a beat em up where you play as your choice of five Sailor Moon characters. I've got to confess, I know next to nothing about Sailor Moon. I don't know if that affects my enjoyment of this one or not. You have an attack button and a jump button. If you press both together, you can do a move that will drop all enemies in your immediate vicinity, but at the expense of some of your life, naturally. Your other button is your magic attack, and this will only work if you have some crystals. This will bring your character on screen to do a little animation for you, and then your enemies are magically damaged. Like Golden Axe, the more you have, the better your attack will be. Unlike Golden Axe, however, this one isn't tremendously fun to play. You often get overwhelmed by tons of on-screen enemies that are extremely difficult to escape from. It becomes annoying rather quickly, especially since your life bar is small and you can't take much damage. It's definitely a quarter muncher. The AI is also demonstrably stupid. Look at this guy down here who won't come out so I can kick his ass, which I need to do to move on. Get out of here, you little punk! And of course, there's a timer counting down as well, so I get penalized for the bad AI. There's not a large assortment of enemies. You'll see these doll things as well as these guys with tennis rackets quite a bit. The graphics are really nice though. There's a good variety of backgrounds and they all look great. The animations of your special moves for each character fill the screen and they look very professional. It's very rare to see animation like this in video games from the time. It really does stand out. The music is awful. Some of it sounds like a monkey banging away on a cheap toy piano. I had to turn the volume way down on this one to help preserve what's left of my sanity. I ended up getting quite bored with this one before I finished it, and overall, I don't really recommend it. However, Sailor Moon fans might enjoy it more than I did. The home games are probably better, which may be why this one was never ported. This is Kozori Okami from Ichibutsu, released in 1987. This is based on the manga of the same name, which is also known in some circles as Lonely Wolf and Cub. This arcade game was only ever released in Japan. In this hack and slash style beat em up, you play as a samurai who carries a baby on his back. You need to work your way to the end of the stage, all while being attacked by every conceivable enemy in the entire country. Seriously, there are a lot of people here who would prefer it if you were not alive. Your existence is very much inconvenient for them. You attack with your sword, and most enemies will die with a single slash, but some require two or more hits. You can slice open stone pillars to get coins or points or other items. One of them loads your baby into a cart, which lets you blow away all of your enemies while increasing your speed. Getting this power-up is pretty fun, but alas, it doesn't last long. You can also get different weapons like this one, which will give you more of a reach. At the end of the stage is a boss who is presumably a major character from the comic book. It'll take many quarters to learn the best methods to kill these guys. Speaking of quarters, you will start at the very beginning of the stage if you continue, so the game will require you to learn it. Actually, since this one was only released in Japan, I doubt it takes quarters, but you get my drift. If you die, you do get set back a little, but usually not too far. The worst part about this game is that you have no invincibility period when you take a hit, so the enemy can crowd around you, and if that happens, well, you're dead. You do have a block button, but you're frozen while you press it, so I find its usefulness a bit limited. It's also difficult to tell where the jumping enemies are going to land because they have no shadows. They don't jump in a straight horizontal line, and they can land anywhere, and usually it's going to be wherever you are. I found that plowing ahead as fast as possible while occasionally turning around to kill the guy behind me was the best way to get through a level. The graphics are about average for a 1987 arcade game, with most of the characters being fairly small. The music is pretty good, especially for its time, but there aren't a large variety of tunes, at least that I was able to hear. It's too bad that this game didn't see a home port to consoles. With a small amount of rebalancing, this could have been a fun time at home on the 8-bit consoles, or maybe even an early 16-bit game.
Here's Stadium Cross by Sega, which came to the arcades in 1992. This game is exactly what the title suggests, a motocross racing event in a stadium. You race four laps and try to finish first. You have a choice of one track. You're mostly racing the clock, as even if you're in first place, you'll still lose if the time runs out. I guess that means everyone else behind you loses too. And the timer is not generous at all. One thing that can sometimes be a problem about emulation is that it's difficult to replicate the exact controls of the arcade. While that limitation might hurt you here, there's honestly not much more to see than I'm showing you. Even if you win first place, it's game over. This is it. It's one of those Sega arcade games that spans multiple screens for multiplayer, and getting a bunch of people to buy in and race each other seems to be the game's draw compared to actual substance. Sometimes if you bump into another racer, you'll automatically throw what looks to be a quick punch. It doesn't seem to do much though. The announcer doesn't have much to say, but he says it a lot. Some of you might think that this game did come home to the incredible 32X console. That game was called Motocross Championship, and it is not the same game, though I can certainly understand how one might confuse the two. Stadium Cross is the much better playing, looking, and sounding game, even if you don't have the sweet motorcycle hand grip as your controller like the arcade. This one could have been great if it had a bunch of different tracks and a bunch of different locations, and the lack of variety here is what really holds it back. This would have been a fun one on the Saturn with controls designed for the console, but without more meat on its bones, there was never the possibility of a home port. Is in the lead. One to go. Beautiful weather here at Sega Stadium, and in the floodlights, a wild battle is taking place. Number one, hit! Number three! Number one is in the lead. Number one runs off the court. Okay, up next I've got a couple of racing games, and arcade racing games are usually pretty fun. But I'm saving what I feel is the best game in this episode to the very last. This one's called Faster Than Speed from Sammy, released in 2004. If you're going faster than speed, does that mean you don't have any speed? I don't understand the title. This is a racing game where you race a rival at night, and only at night. There's also a multiplayer mode where you each take turns racing and whoever ends up with the fastest time after it's all said and done wins. As you drive, a nitrous canister will automatically charge. Use it to blast ahead in a burst of speed. Then wait a few more seconds for it to recharge automatically and do it again, just like in real life. Neon pink arrows will guide you where you need to go and it's a good thing that they're there as it can sometimes be tough to see where curves and intersections are. There are three stages to beat, novice, pro, and expert. Beat them all and it's game over. These three stages can be picked from a bunch of different locations. There's nothing tremendously notable or spectacular about this one and that's likely why it was never adapted for home play. At one point when I was playing, I rammed into this and I found that there was no way to back out and get out of this mess. I had to let the timer run out. I still almost won the race though. The graphics aren't bad at all, but the fact that all of the races take place at night doesn't really lend itself to a lot of variety. There are quite a few different tracks, but they don't feel that different from one another. The music and sound are both adequate, and that's the best way to describe this game, adequate. I'd recommend playing Need for Speed Underground instead. A better racing game with speed in the title is Maximum Speed. So this is the maximum speed that can be achieved, but still slower than faster than speed. I don't know about these titles. Anyway, like faster than speed, this is also from Sammy, but it was released a year earlier in 2003. In this one, you select from three different types of vehicles, stock, truck, and open wheel, which is basically Formula One. Then you select one of six tracks to race on. Each vehicle type shares the same selection of tracks. Then you choose which performance you'd like, faster top speed, better acceleration, or all around. Then your transmission, and finally you get to race. It's definitely a fast racing game, and it might remind you of Daytona at first. While it can't really match Daytona, it certainly is no slouch. 
No matter which combination of car type and tracks you choose, you get six laps to race on and then it's game over, even if you win. These six laps can go by pretty quick as the tracks are generally pretty small. You can also nudge cars out of the way if you're careful and this can help you keep your position. Even then, this game is no cakewalk. You even have a timer to worry about, and yes, it can run out, but that only happened once for me. Even if you lose, it's still fun to try again to see if you can do better. The graphics are pretty nice and move super fast as you can see. I also really like the colors. The track designs could perhaps be a little better, but come on, this is Sammy we're talking about. The music is probably adequate, but you won't be hearing much of it as it's buried by the extremely loud sound effects. This would have been a great game to get ported home, maybe giving each type of vehicle a bunch of exclusive tracks in addition to the six arcade ones. Maybe add a career mode. Otherwise, it's a fun curiosity for half an hour or so. This is Beirut by Sunsoft, released in 1989. It was distributed by Sega on their hardware. Have you ever wondered what Contra would be like if Sunsoft made their very own version? Well, me neither, but here you go. You're a dude out to save the world and rescue a girl. And I'm guessing it takes place in Beirut, hence the name. As you can see, it's a side-scrolling run and gun. You have four different weapons and you can switch between them at any time with your very own dedicated weapon switching button. The normal default weapon is pretty basic just like you'd expect. The second one only fires when you're crouching and it's for ground-based enemies. The third is a sweet flamethrower for roasting your foes. I like this one a lot. The last one ricochets into multiple shots when it hits something. Each weapon can be powered up twice, but those power-ups will go away when you die. And guess what? You're gonna die a lot! Interestingly, you can take a few hits before you die, unlike Contra. You think that this would make the game easier, and I'm sure it is easier than if you only could be hit once, but it's still kind of tough. The stages are pretty standard and don't throw anything amazing or even surprising at you. Like, you just know these chandeliers are gonna fall when you walk under them, right? How does the structural integrity of these chandeliers know exactly when to give up and fall on you? There is a single stage that plays like a simple shooter. This doesn't last very long, but it is a nice break in the playstyle. Overall, the control is decent, but you can't shoot down, even when jumping. The graphics are pretty bland for a 1989 arcade game. There's not much going on here other than the touch of scaling here and there. The music is okay, but there's not a huge variety of tunes. I do like the sound of your enemies dying. Being killed by me sounds very inconvenient for them. There's not much here that's particularly noteworthy, which is likely why this one never got a home port. However, many aspects of this game bear a striking similarity to Sunsoft's own Journey to Silius on the NES, which came out the next year. The two games only share a few staff members, but the shared designs can't be a coincidence. Still, I'd recommend that you play Journey to Silius over this one as it's much more fleshed out and fun. Here's Dirty Pigskin Football from Sammy, which was released in 2004. This is a great unconventional sports game, just like you'd expect to see in an arcade. It's so easy for anyone to pick up and play. You choose from several different teams, consisting of only five players each. Then you play similar such teams. For my team here, I chose a bunch of wrestlers, and my first game is against a bunch of generic regular football players. How boring are these guys? You can choose from a few different plays, but honestly, I find it doesn't make a huge difference. That's because the action is fast and anything goes. The field is small and there are no first downs, which means you only have four attempts to make a touchdown. A passing touchdown is worth seven points. If you simply run it in without throwing, it's six points. A safety is worth two points. There are no field goals or kicking plays and the entire match is only three minutes long. Oh, and there are no timeouts either. The offense is always running up into the screen. 
There's a super tackle, which is mainly for show, but there are other super moves which can give you a super fast throw, for example. The game is extremely fast paced and also extremely fun. Probably the best arcade football game I've ever played. Up to four players can enjoy this one simultaneously. It's not super easy against the CPU, but it's always fun, even when you're losing. The graphics here are plenty fine for such a game and run at a great frame rate. It's always fun seeing the unique stadiums that all the different teams play in. The music is good and I love the bone crunching sound effects that make you feel every hit. I couldn't tell you why this one never made it home. I mean, seriously, what the hell? I feel like this would have been pretty popular. This is up there with NBA Jam when it comes to arcade style sports games. Maybe people in the PlayStation 2 era didn't want such games? Nah, I can't believe that. Playing this with friends is even better than playing against the CPU, and playing against the CPU is awesome. Seriously, they need to bring this one home. It's time. Boy. Second down! And there you go, quite a few more home consoles that were never blessed with an official home console port. It's kind of sad that arcades are pretty much obsolete these days, and come on, home consoles played no small part in that. How do you feel about that? And also, what do you think about the games I talked about in this episode? Would you have liked it if any or many or none came home? I'm messing up my sentence, but it doesn't matter, because I'm at the end of this episode. So, like always, thank you for watching GameSack. Welcome back to my video game show. You may think that all I like is the, the Sega games, but I actually have a lot more than the Sega games. In fact, over there I have the, the, the Super Nintendo games, so let's go review some, some Super Nintendo games. Boy, it sure is a long way to walk to get over to my Super Nintendo games, but let's keep going. We're finally here. Here are all my Super Nintendo games. I have a lot, so let's review some. Like this one. This is Super Castlevania 4. I like this one because it's the sequel to Castlevania 3. Or maybe this one. Fatal Fury 2. Or how about this one? This one's one of my favorites. F-Zero. Good racing game. Or how about this one? Lunar 2. Oh, this isn't a Super Nintendo game. <laughs> or how about this one? Oh, look. Here's $5. I'm going to go buy a new Super Nintendo game. No, you silly goose. You can't come with me. This is my $5. I get to choose the Super Nintendo game. Anyway, I'll see you in the next video.